For all of their similarities, the range of vehicles that fall under the motorhome umbrella are a broad and diverse lot. Take the Class B. This relatively compact grouping of RVs offer many of the creature comforts buyers seek out in a motorhome, while their likeness to a large van is telling of how approachable they can be for the RV novice. Class A motorhomes, on the other hand, offer a sharp contrast in dynamics. These much wider vehicles practically devour lane space, while stretching as long as 45 feet from bumper to bumper. In their largest form, they resemble something more akin to a tour bus than a camper van. And getting behind the wheel can be an intimidating prospect for the uninitiated. Another way to look at it is that if you can learn to drive a Class A motorhome, there's not much else you won't be able to drive. Today, we're back in Palm Springs, California with our RVers Caitlin and Peter. Last time, Caitlin got her first taste behind the wheel of a Class A diesel pusher in the safety of a parking lot under Peter's tutelage. While her enthusiasm was certainly intact, the sheer size of the vehicle, the speed, and the coordination required to execute the proper push-pull steering technique around corners, combined with first-time jitters, proved to be quite the challenge. I can usually tell within about the first 20 or 30 seconds if someone's going to get off to a quick start, if they're a real natural. I'm not sure about Caitlin yet. I can't tell. She's having a little trouble with the steering. I taught her how to do push-pull steering. She's getting a little crossed up with that. I have to wait and see how it goes before we go out on the street. Kate's had a bit of a rocky start, but if there's a surefire road to progress, it's called practice. And that's precisely the route Peter is leading her through. For someone who started off having a fair amount of trouble out of the box, Caitlin stepped it up pretty well here. I'm pretty confident we're going to be all right if we go out on the road. So that was in the parking lot. You ready to go out on the road? Maybe. <laughs> OK, let's fire back up. Same okay. thing as before. We're going to be doing more straight lines for the moment. OK. All right, so we're going to take it out. We're going to go right up where it says stop up there, go to the stop sign, make a left. OK. Okay. <sighs> Nothing to it. Okay, and just don't get too close to the stop sign because you're not familiar with your width yet. And make this super smooth, just a little throttle and nice smooth push pull. And you can round this turn right out because you're making a left. Nice and easy. And after those rear wheels hump over like that, now you can accelerate out. That's it. Oh my gosh, here we go. We're on the road. Ah! Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first thing we're going to work on right here, lane control. OK. So this is all about just getting comfortable driving at speed. And even though we're in town here, there's nothing challenging about this from that standpoint. It's a very wide lane. Yep. There's no parked cars on the right. You're going to glance at that left mirror and see how close you are to the white line. Yep, I, I have been. I see you. <laughs> There's nothing to this, huh? No, this is pretty easy. I like driving in straight lines. <laughs> so we're going to do now, we're going to practice those left turns now. We're going to do a bunch of them. OK. And we're going to get you to the point where it's just a no-brainer and you're bored and you want to make rights because it's a challenge. OK, sounds good. Good. So I want to tell you the difference between making a square and a round turn. Square turns are made to get through tight places. Okay. A big, open, rounded left like that with no one waiting at the stop sign there, you can round it out. OK. OK? As you go. That's it. As you go. Perfect. And you don't have to cover the brake there so much. Just be careful about putting too much throttle on as you come around. OK? So now cover the brake again. <laughs> ah, that's why you cover the brake. 
You see how your hand slipped on the wheel? Yep. That's why you cover the brake, so you can't accidentally accelerate when you're not in control. Excellent. I'm getting it. Getting it. So leave it I'll surely. I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> Make this as smooth as you can. See how smooth you can be on that steering wheel. And part of that will be not over-accelerating. That's right. That was the best turn you've made yet. It was very good, very good. So now that Kate's got the left turns down, we're gonna do the more difficult move, and that's a right turn. Right turns are more difficult because we drive on the right side of the road, so the curb is closer to us, both before and after the turn. Now we're really gonna challenge her and see if she's up to the task. Now, I want you to stop at the stop sign here and think about this turn. Now, we're on a low traffic road here for a reason, because I want to be able to stop and think about these things. This is a pretty narrow road you're having yeah. to turn on now, here. Now, notice, though, we've stayed away from the right-hand side, correct? Mm -hmm. And you're going to stick your nose perfectly straight out. But you'll notice we do not have a four-way stop here. Ooh. So you'll want to inch up a little bit if you can't see well. Keep that foot over the brake. Am I ready to make this turn? You tell me. You clear? I am clear. Safe. So now, so sure. you crank hard. Oh, stop. What? Crank hard, crank hard, crank hard. <laughs> so this is why we have, you're OK, you're going to make it. This is why we have you practice all these over and over again to do that. That's exactly why. Okay. No biggie. You see, it got away from you a little bit there. Yes, it did. So what and, you want to do. And I didn't, like the pull, the push-pull thing in the steering. I was like, what do I do, push or pull first? <laughs> <laughs> Just like every new driver, Kate's having a little trouble with the right turns at first, even though she got the left turns down, because they are more difficult. Let's see how it goes. Make a right at the stop sign. And again, this is a little tight. OK. So drift left, but stay okay. straight. Drift left and stay straight. The tighter the street you're turning onto, the more you stay to your left. Right, Juice it out. Foot over the brake and crank hard. Juice. <laughs> You see how close you came? It was perfect, but you got closer this time because you didn't overshoot. OK? okay. That was good. And that's going to take you a little while here. <laughs> so this is the same turn that you had a little trouble with last time. So you're staying wide. You just want to make sure that you got your signal on and that you watch that right mirror for someone who doesn't know. And what I want you to do is juice the accelerator a little to nose it out. Okay. And then cover the brake and do the whole turn with your foot over the brake. So grade yourself on that one. It was maybe like a B. B? That was a solid A. <laughs> yes. That was awesome. Thank you. It was perfect. You covered the brake, you turned at the right point. You turned smoothly and quickly. You watched your mirror. You placed yourself about a foot from the curb. It was perfect. Now she's really getting it. Not only is she hitting the mark, but she's looking in the mirror on the right-hand side, and she knows she got it. That's a sign of real progress. In a normal training situation, obviously, I have many days and weeks with a trainee to have them progress along. Because we wanted to see what Kate could do in one day, we've compressed this. And I have to say that for someone who hadn't driven a motorhome before ever, hadn't even ridden on one, and also started off a little questioning in my mind as to how well she was going to do and if we could even get her on the road in the first day, Kate was amazing. She made more progress from that parking lot to the time we finished than probably 90% of the students I've ever taught. She had trouble in the beginning. And then she rallied and did absolutely great. Pull over right on the, past this car, and you're going to pull over on the right side. Don't get too close to it. That's it. And we're going to slide along the right here. <laughs> As Caitlin's crash course demonstrates, learning to drive a motorhome can certainly be fraught with challenge and comes with a definite learning curve. But with a competent instructor, an understanding of basic techniques, and lots of practice, anyone with a desire and willingness to learn is equipped with all the tools they need for success.
the decision to pursue a life on the road will look a little different for each and every RVer out there. For some, it may be a dream years in the making. For others, it might come in a moment of inspiration that suddenly snaps everything into focus. I'm Tom. And I'm Caitlin. And we are the Mortons. We've been traveling in our RV since September 2015. We're originally from Michigan, and the idea to hit the road full time happened one winter when we took a week long vacation down to Florida. We had a wonderful time in the sun, and when we came back, we flew into Detroit, landed in a blizzard, had to drive our car two hours back home in said blizzard, and as we were driving home, we were like, why did we come back? Neither of us really like winter, and we were, we were just like, oh, this isn't what we want, and we drove by an RV dealership, and I turned to her, and I said, aren't those things like, houses on wheels. Don't it people live in them? Didn't really know anything about it, but by the time we got home, we decided we were gonna buy an RV and go south. We knew we wanted to make a change, but we weren't sure what. We knew we wanted to move out of Michigan, but we didn't know where, because we didn't do a lot of traveling besides the two weeks of vacation that we had every year. So we, we really hadn't explored the United States. So when it kind of, the light bulb went off that an RV could allow us to travel to these places and experience them without fully living there yet, and sort of test them out and immerse ourselves in the community, which this lifestyle allows you to do so well, just to get a glimpse of a different place, a different culture, a different community. And that was just, it was just an awesome, eye-opening experience. You can do that with an RV. And once we decided that, it, it just, it made all the sense in the world for us. Among the host of unknowns many potential full-time RVers face, how to sustain a life on the road financially is sure to be near the top of the list. While some may be fortunate enough to have an existing job that they can perform remotely, for many others, arriving at a solution will require some serious out-of-the-box thinking. In the Morton's case, what began as a practical way to remain connected with family back home has evolved into a full-time gig as YouTubers sharing their journey with the world. We originally started our YouTube channel, Morton's on the Move, to just document our travels, um, mostly for our parents. Uh, so that they knew that we were alive and well, because uh, that was a big concern when we broke the news to them. Like, what the heck are you doing? After we started making the YouTube channel, we realized that other people were interested in following our story, and so we just kind of started building it from there and sharing information that we learned along the way. And now it has kind of morphed into this kind of overarching message to get out there and explore. Even if you know you can't hit the road full time in an RV, go out there, explore your town, explore your state park, explore the country as much as you can. Get outside of that box because there are so many beautiful and wonderful things to see and do. And we just really want people to get outside their comfort zone and find what inspires them. I think that whether you're RVing as a, a young couple uh, for vacations or working on the road like ourselves or even retired, I think that everyone can have these amazing experiences in RVs. The RVing lifestyle, it crosses so many boundaries and at RV parks, we make friends with people who are retired and people who are younger than us and have families left and right. And a lot of times we're able to just bond and make such amazing connections over the same lifestyle and the same journey that we're on. When we tell people what we do, that we travel the United States and we just go wherever we want to, when we want to, everyone's like, I wish I could do that. And the truth is, like, anyone can. I mean, we, we left jobs, we left a house, we had horses, cars, basement full of stuff that we barely ever used. And it was a lot of work to get rid of it, but it is possible. And so for us to share our story, we hope that that inspires other people to do the same thing. Whether you're looking to become full-time RVers like the Mortons, or you're dreaming of a part-time RV lifestyle, venturing into the unknown can be a scary thing even for the most adventurous of us. But as the Morton story demonstrates, taking the plunge and pursuing a dream at any cost, chasing an adventure that may appear to be outside the realm of what's possible, promises a once-in-a-lifetime experience that you'll surely not regret.
With a variety of electronics, lights, and appliances, powering an RV can be a challenge. So the RV geeks share their tip on one of the simplest and most effective ways of increasing power efficiency, LED lights. Fellow RVer Steve at M4 LED breaks down the benefits of swapping your bulbs beginning with the reduction of battery power and heat. Why LEDs? What's different about them from other light? The most important thing for people when they want to go to LED generally is going to be power consumption. They want to get their power usage down. RVers tend to boondock and uh, anything that you can do to reduce the power is going to make you stay on battery power out there for a longer amount of time. With an incandescent or a halogen light, when you're switching to LED, you're going to use about one-tenth the power on average. If you have fluorescent lighting in your RV and you switch to LED, you're going to use about half the power. One of the things we've noticed is that halogens particularly get incredibly hot, and LEDs, people talk about power savings, but for those of us who have used them now, we know that the heat is even a bigger issue sometimes because if we're dry camping or boondocking out in the, in the desert or out off the grid, we don't necessarily have the ability to run the air conditioning as easily. So how much difference is it gonna make to have LEDs when it comes to heat? So when it comes to an incandescent or a halogen, they're gonna be well over 200 degrees at their surface temperature, whereas an LED will be around 100 degrees. There's still a little bit of heat that's generated. It's, it comes to undo efficiency and uh, the LED is much more efficient. So it is gonna create a small amount of heat, but it's gonna be substantially less. Saying goodbye is a big component of RVing as the transition from stability to spontaneity naturally requires some adjustments. With the excitement of hitting the road also comes the difficulty of parting with family and friends, the convenience of a permanent residence, and most likely a spacious kitchen. But perhaps the worst of all, we must very reluctantly say farewell to a guaranteed and stable internet connection. These days, being online is a crucial element of travel for reasons that include planning your route, staying in touch, managing your finances, or even earning an income. Luckily, understanding your options to staying connected is far less challenging with the guidance of tech nomads Chris and Cherie, who are all over the subject with their straightforward breakdown of how to keep your internet manageable when you migrate. The most frequent question we get asked is what is the best mobile internet solution when you're RVing? And well, the answer is there is no answer. There is no one single best that is the best everywhere you might happen to go because you're mobile. And the best solution is the one that works at your location right now. To help determine the best solution for your location, Chris and Cherie suggest answering four basic questions prior to examining the options available. One of the most important questions to ask yourself is just how important is staying connected for you? If you have to work a nine to five job and be online at 9 a.m. Monday morning or you get fired, well, that's a whole different type of need than somebody who just wants to check email on occasion and maybe make a few future reservations or you know, keep up with their grandkids or their kids. The next question you have to ask yourself, what is your travel style going to be? If you're just going to be going to an RV park in a metro area where there's a lot of options and you're gonna be staying put, that's a very different problem to solve than someone who's going to be going out into the remote boondocks and boondocking off-grid far away from cellular towers. And how long are you going to be staying at each location? If you're gonna be hypermobile, moving every few days, you're gonna probably need more options because you're gonna be having a lot more variability in your life than someone who might be staying somewhere seasonally where they can optimize for one solution. So if you're setting up for an extended stay, it might make sense to invest in even having cable pulled to your site or setting up a directional antenna up a mast, but that's the sort of thing you're not gonna do if you're just there for a couple days. 
The next question you'd ask is, what is your budget for this? You've got to look at what your budget is and spend the money wisely on the solutions that you select. And start off simple and add on as you need it because it just digging yourself into a hole if you throw a lot of money at a problem and you can't even understand the solution you've built. And that brings us to the fourth question you really should ask yourself is, what is your comfort with technology? If this stuff intimidates you, <laughs> keep it simple. But if you like to geek out and it actually gets you excited to do some work to pick up a signal further away than anybody else, have fun doing it. But it doesn't have to be complicated. After you've assessed the degree of importance for having internet, it's time to explore the options of acquiring it. There are three basic options that most RVers standardize on. So there's Wi-Fi, which a lot of people think, hey, that's going to be free, simple, and easy because the RV park advertises, hey, there's free Wi-Fi here to be had. And then there's cellular, the same technology that you use to make a call on your smartphone is the same technology that can provide internet access for you to check your email and stream your Netflix. And then, of course, there is satellite, which a lot of people really get excited about because the dream of satellite is that it can work anywhere you've got a view of the sky, you know, anywhere in the world even. What are the pros and cons of each of these options? With Wi-Fi, if your RV park offers it, you might be able to get online with it from your site. But there's a lot of downsides to Wi-Fi that might not make it usable for someone who relies on internet access. One of the setbacks of Wi-Fi is often a weak signal, in which case an antenna can be attached to your rig for a stronger connection. Or you can consider option two. Cellular has a lot of pros going for it. It's available anywhere that your cellular carrier has a tower and a signal reaches you, which is a lot of places these days. But, well, cellular also can suffer from overloaded towers, or there's a lot of complications and limitations with plans that might limit how you actually are able to share that connection with your other devices. And that stuff changes all the time. <laughs> so you have to pick which cellular carrier you want to use, and there are multiple of them in the U.S., and you have to pick the gear that you want to use. It could be as simple as hotspotting off your smartphone. Now, most phones allow you to just create a personal hotspot. Your phone is then sharing a connection that your tablets and your laptops and anybody you want to allow can then access your cellular connection. Or you can use something that is a mobile hotspot, often known as a, a Jetpack or a MiFi or various other names. This is like a phone without the phone ability. It does that same feature, takes a cellular connection, and makes a Wi-Fi hotspot around you that multiple devices can connect to. And then the last option is satellite. And those are satellites that are up in space, far, far away, broadcasting a signal down to Earth. Yeah, so the catch with satellite is speed of light actually starts to have an impact. You're communicating with something that's 26,000 miles over the equator, and, well, it takes time for the signal to go there and bounce back down. Or there's other satellites that are lower down in lower orbits, but they're moving rapidly through the sky, so you can't really aim at them easily. To get broadband speeds on satellite, you have to have dishes that are really huge, and that's a lot to carry along in an RV. But if you are way out in the boonies and that is your only option, it's a great option. On the other hand, if you're OK with very, very slow speeds, there are devices that are satellite messengers that are text messaging anywhere in the world at super, super slow speeds. You're not surfing the web. You're not viewing pictures. But you can get out the important messages of, like, I'm here safe, or you can share a GPS track. And that works anywhere and are pretty practical. So those are the three basic options that RVers use. And you can keep very connected in an RV or sometimes just shut off the internet and get out and explore the wonderful places that you're at. When transitioning to a rolling home, it's likely that your internet connection becomes just as free-spirited as your new way of life, both coming and going unexpectedly. But in addition to these technomatic tips, it's also a smart idea to unplug once in a while, step outside, and just recharge.